principles of assessment, so we'll deal with more of this um, on Tuesday. Um, what I do want to make you guys aware of, if you haven't noticed yet, that there's only one project in this class, um, and it's against group project, um, but it's a paper and it's a presentation. Okay? Paper's about three, four pages. Uh, it's the same groups you're assigned with the other project in field class, so we just kept the groups the same. Uh, but this project deals with, so remember I was talking yesterday about how information always gets updated? Okay, so that's what this is for. So each group of three or four students, I think there's one group of four, but each group of three students must review uh, two to three peer-reviewed articles. So it's not many articles, one article each. Okay, and you guys have done that at the library rotation. Um, on one of the following assessment-related topics, specific injuries, special tests, postural or biomechanical assessment, or any other topic that I approve of. So just let me know if there's something else that you're really interested in, let me know. This paper should be approximately you know, three or four pages. Uh, and summarize and critically evaluate, so connect, compare, and contrast the articles, and then use APA. <coughs> now the presentation, uh, so these are your group numbers. These are the general topics. So anything, injuries, postural, biomechanical assessment, special test that has to do with this body area is what you're responsible for. Where do we find out which group number we are? I'll show you in one second. Okay. From a scheduling perspective, the reason, the reason why I'm showing you now is because the presentation for ankle, lower leg, and foot takes place on the same day we start which is in two weeks. So whoever group one is, that's your first pretty quick assignment. But once you're done, you're done. Okay. So there's some pros and cons of being the first group. If you get it done right away, you don't have to worry about it later on. Um, so that is when your presentation will be. Okay, so group one to group 10 is already aligned there. It's a five minute presentation and you can do it whichever way you want. PowerPoint, you can make a YouTube clip and just show the YouTube clip if you want. You can stand up here if you want to read. I prefer you not to read, but just discuss. It's really, really flexible. Okay, but you're just discussing the main points of the articles. Kind of like what we did at the orientation, right? You guys looked at the two articles. What's the key points of those articles? What are you taking from this? What can you give us to use from that information? Okay. Um, any questions about that assignment? What groups you're in. So when you open up your Blackboard site under your announcements, uh, you'll have any kind of group assignments down on this side. So I've actually joined group one in both classes just so that you can see what my page looks like. So musculoskeletal peripheral, so that's uh, the one assignment, and that's the other assignment. If you actually go into the course, so let's pick uh, Britt. That's the key. Is that too small in back there? <coughs> Maybe a little bit. Okay. That's better. Cool. So on the side, you can use, description of the assignment, and also your team members. Okay, so that's, uh, that's group, I'm part of group one apparently. So that's group one. Okay, so in every class, you just look for my groups, and you click on that, and then go to the home page, and it'll show you all the information. Okay, uh, when you submit it, any assignments just go under the assignment link, click on the actual assignment itself, 
and you upload any documents or files by attaching it just like an email attachment. So any questions about the assignment? Okay, so have a look at which group you belong to and then start talking, to, well, figure out when your due date is and then start talking about what topic you guys want to chat about. Um, an example, I think I put an example. Okay, so this is what I sent you guys. I put it on the down for some of you might have gotten the email, but it says, to find out the names of your partners, click on my groups. So that's what I just went over. A list of group projects will appear along with all the collaborations <coughs> available uh, through Blackboard. Click on the group homepage and you'll see your partners with the description of the project. Your partners, topics, and due dates will, were all randomly selected. Um, send me an email for your specific topic. For example, if your group is responsible for angle special tests, uh, so that your specific topic could be, if you decide to do it, is auto angle rules versus buffalo angle rules. Have you heard of auto angle rules? Have you heard of buffalo? Yeah, there's buffalo too. And there's another set of rules. Um, that is that actually has made a huge impact. The auto angle rules. Uh, there was a paper, uh, sorry, there's a newspaper article about it two days ago in the Globe. Um, surprisingly enough, so. Anyways, uh, that might be a good topic. Someone's done that before, but you know you might find new information now. Um, please be aware of what your paper and presentation are doing. If you need assistance, just let me know. Okay, so that's it. So that's an example of uh, a special test related to the angle area. Okay, if you want to do something injury related, um, high angle sprains versus uh, lateral angle sprains would be a good uh, type of topic. Okay, so, uh, principles of assessment. Um, today, uh, we'll talk about principles in general. We'll talk about history taking, and we'll try to get through all the way to palpation. So observations, and then range of motion testing, along with palpation. Okay, so it's really gonna be interactive. Um, and then same thing on Monday. Uh, on Monday, we'll continue with palpation. Uh, joint play, um, I never learned about that when I was in school. Uh, and so it's kind of cool that you guys are getting it here. Um, and then special test, that's really going to be short because that's more uh, body area specific. Um, so we'll talk about it. We might try a couple things in here, but we're not going to go too crazy with special tests. Are your lectures on Blackboard too? Uh, this one Janelle puts up on oh. Blackboard. I usually put my PowerPoints up on Blackboard as well. Um, I was thinking about trying something different um, and like posting the videos in, in my class. Um, because I think it's useful. So, if you guys think it's useful too. But it doesn't excuse you for missing class. Don't just go and watch the videos in actual class. Because you can get theory and stuff, but in actuality, you need to apply these skills with your hands. So, you get that for your day class. Um, and then, last but not least, on Monday, we'll definitely do uh, some scenarios, um, some mock CATA type scenarios. Okay, so uh, these are the learning objectives, and we'll kind of um, do these in part um, as the day goes through. Um, so to understand the rationale for systematic process, organizational structure, so there is a process you need to follow that's partially what you're graded on, and if you forget sections of it, those are huge mark deductions. More importantly, you might be miss you might be missing something during your assessment that's pertinent information to figure out what the injury actually is. So the reason why you go through the process is so that you don't miss anything. You consider all possibilities. Um, to understand the importance of informed consent and documentation as part of all clinical evaluations. Okay, that's from a legal standpoint. So provide a list of relevant questions. That's your history taking. Uh, down below is also part of your history taking. And then to understand the rationale for systematic process or, or you know, is that the right? 
to identify the general principles of observations, um, and then the principles of the physical exam. Okay, so that's your range of motion testing, um, your functional testing, your special testing, and your palpation. Um, this point here is often challenging to some people, so to understand the rationale of when and why you do a scanning exam uh, versus a clearing exam. How many of you guys heard that term before, scanning and clearing? Okay. Um, so that's something that's, uh, that's new to a lot of people. Okay? So, uh, but that's usually a, pr a pretty big challenge for people uh, that we've noticed over the last few years. So we'll spend some time on that. And the last but not least, to explain the concepts of validity and reliability and how they pertain to the assessment process. And that's the last piece. Okay, so I put this up before. That's our scope of practice. That's right off the CAC website. You really understand the limits of professional knowledge and to utilize the knowledge, skill set, and experience of your peers and professionals uh, is perhaps the most important element of working with your athletes and clients. Okay, I put this up yesterday. That's what we are, certified athletic therapists. And we'll start here. This is the goal of the orthopedic exam. Assessments are the basis of all therapy treatments. You cannot do something unless you know what the problem is. You're not going to go into a mechanic and he's just going to change your tires just for the heck of it. Okay. You need to know what the problem is before you fix it. So everything that you do from treatment, rehab, injury management standpoint is strictly based on what you find and what you assess it as. You could make a mistake and then treat it and the treatment may not work. So now you have to go back and reassess. To provide a base of information for which appropriate treatment decisions and medical referrals can be made, an assessment is ongoing. You see someone on the field, they get hurt, you put rice on, not the rice, sorry, you apply rice, the rice principle, they come in to see in the clinic, you reassess if anything's changed. You give them a couple, you give them a rehab plan, you treat again, they come in three days later, you have to reassess. Assessment is ongoing. Now you're not going to do exactly the same type of assessment three, four, five days later, a week or two later. You might be a little bit more refined in your process. But it is ongoing. Um, these are just different philosophies. Um, some people are more muscle oriented, some people more joint oriented. Um, so some of these people, if you talk to Mackenzie, he'll say everything's from the low back. So there's the Mackenzie assessment. And, uh, some of these people are very chiro based. Um, if you talk to many chiropractors, they'll say everything stems from the spine, as that's what they focus on. Um, so these are just different philosophies um, of w the way assessments are approached. Differential diagnosis. So we're going to ask you at the end of your history, at the end of each of these sections that we'll talk about, what your differential diagnosis is. So what do you think it is? And you have to give us three ideas of what you think it is. And those ideas might change as the assessment goes through. But a differential diagnosis is the process of weighing the probability of one disease versus that of other diseases, possibly accounting for the patient's illness. Comparing and contrasting. If you learn about different conditions, you're going to have to be able to compare and contrast the different conditions, not just from the signs and symptoms, but from the functional testing as well. So often, I'll stand up here and tell you, between a medial and a lateral ankle sprain, what's the difference when it comes to active range of motion? So now you have to know what, okay, what's active range of motion. Okay, you tell someone to do something, they do it themselves. That tests muscle, that, that tests contractile and non-contractile tissue. So if somebody has a medial ankle sprain and a lateral ankle sprain, what's the difference? What will one person complain of that's different than the other person? Let's start with that. Any ideas? Anybody ever have a lateral ankle sprain before? Lots of people. Medial? Those are rare. I think Mandy was talking about his, uh, we'll talk about his player in a second, but it was just happened yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Kick the ball. Pain on the inside of the foot or outside of the foot? Um, the side, lateral side. Lateral side. But the way he kicked the ball was an inversion mechanism. Kind of strange. I kind of have an idea. When I kicked the ball, he just received like a pass. So the ball hit him. Yeah. Okay. So the ball came in this way, 
and it hurts on this side of the foot. That's kind of weird. Right? If you guys sit there and just turn your ankle like this, where does it feel like it's stretching more? If I stand here like this, where is it stretching more? Stretching on the inside. So why would it hurt on the outside? So may, let's just say that was a medial ankle sprain, and that's a medial ankle sprain. So if you do plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, inversion, knee inversion, what would be painful for someone who has a medial ankle sprain, and what would be painful for someone that has a lateral ankle sprain? Lateral ankle sprain would be inversion. Inversion would typically be painful, but it might, would it be painful for a medial ankle sprain? It could. It might be pinching on that side, so that's something you can't really discount. You have to take that into consideration. What main motion would be painful for someone who has a medial ankle sprain? The opposite. Okay, now that's a simple example. Okay, there's other ones like a supraspinous and infraspinous rotator cuff strain or rotator cuff tendinopathy. How you differentiate between all those between those two? They, their actions are pretty much the same, but how you differentiate between those two? So it gets a little tricky sometimes. But there will come a point in time when, at the end of your conversation, your history taking, you'll have an idea of what it might be. You'll have three ideas of what it might be. Your goal is to compare and contrast those three ideas, and then go through your, the rest of the testing to knock a couple of those out and end up with just one. And if you can't rationalize why you think it's that particular injury, then your assessment hasn't been thorough enough. Uh, the comparison of symptoms of similar diseases so that a correct assessment of the client's actual problem can be made. So that was uh, that was what I was talking about. Clinical reasoning is a term that's thrown around in uh, medical education quite often. Um, and there's different definitions of what clinical reasoning is. Uh, it goes hand in hand with differential diagnosis, but that's the reason you go through to tell someone, to educate someone why you think it's one condition and not the other two. Uh, a simple way to say it is compare versus contrast. So we're comparing contrast versus pattern recognition. Um, how many of you heard of inductive and deductive reasoning? What's inductive? What do you think? In your own words, you have to give me a Webster definition. Sean, what do you think? I hear one which I know one is you're starting broad and going. Yeah, one's like this. Yeah, and then the other one's going to start specific and go broad, and the other one's going to start broad and go specific. Anybody clarify? Induction. Sorry. Deductive versus inductive. Inductive starts small to big. Deductive, big to small. Hi, Karina. Everybody say hi to Karina. Hi. I, I, I told her I'd post a video. Hi, Karina. <laughs> <laughs> so, deductive is big to small. Inductive is small to big. And that's two different ways, two different thought processes people go through. The reason why I'm telling you this is because you have to be aware of what type of process you're going through. Because that will tell you whether you're a novice, this is from the research, or whether you are more advanced. Analytical versus non-analytical. Analytical. Those are the types of people, that's the type of thought processes, where you go through a systematic process through your head, facts, um, and so on and so forth. Non-analytical is that gut feeling. Intuition. You've been through something so many times that you can't really point out why or how you feel that way, but it's so automatic that you're like, it's that. That's the problem. And when I was talking to Manitou about his acting this morning, something popped in my head just from what he said. <coughs> I didn't even have a full assessment on his athlete, but I kind of have a good idea of what it is. And then I would go through my range of motion testing, my special testing, neurological testing, to either support that hypothesis or disprove it. And if I disprove it, I have to start all over again. But I have a pretty good idea of what it might be. So, question is, what thought process do you go through? So the way I arranged it, these are typically one type of process that's pretty similar, and this is another type. Which side of the spectrum do you think a novice student would be and a more advanced expert would be? What do you think would be on this side? Yes. 
story. It's about intuition. Uh, my boss, when I was at Daytona State College, was pregnant. She was with a obstetrician, and it was like she was about like nine. She was like about this tall, but she was like that big, and she was about to pop at some point. I don't know why or when, but she was walking around in the swimming still with that, with that thing, and so. Um, I was a little bit nervous, yeah, but she wasn't, obviously, because I guess she knows her body a little bit better, and her obstetrician was really, really good, and had told her, don't worry, blah, blah. So that Friday night, he actually called at like 3 a.m., and was like, you know, from our last conversation, I think you need to go to the hospital. She's like, I feel fine. I don't have any contractions, nothing. Just sleep in, and you know, go to go to the hospital. And so she went, and within about an hour, she actually had to do an emergency delivery. She did an emergency C-section, and they got the baby out, and everybody's healthy. But they found, and I don't know, like I'm not an obstetrician, so I don't know like the physiology of what happens or why, but she was this close to dying. She would have bled out. Something was wrong with her placenta and whatever. It was based on a conversation that he had a, like, a, like a few hours ago. It just hit him. But he got that gut feeling at 3 a.m. That's this. He's been practicing for about 40 years. How many of you play sports? When you first learn to do a specific skill of that sport, how were you taught? What did they tell you? Uh, what old sport did you play? Volleyball. Give me a skill. Serve. Okay, serve. So how did they teach you when you first learned how to serve? Uh, just break it down in steps, start from the beginning. And, yeah. Do you still think about those steps now? It's automatic. This side is more than novice. This is where you'll be now, which is fine. But at some point, you'll start to recognize patterns, and you'll become automatic. You don't even think about it, right? Okay, when I shoot threes, same thing. Close my eyes. Ah, 15 in a row. It comes to a point where it's automatic. So your assessments will be like that at some point. You're not going to think about, where do I put my hands when I go walk this test? Oh. I can grab a leg and just, and I feel it every single time. Guaranteed, the first time you guys do allotments, you're like, am I doing it right? I know I read the book and it said, put my hand here, put my head here, put my leg here, and pull here and support there, and you're doing everything it says, but you don't feel, you don't feel it. With practice repetition, you will. You'll get to this point. You'll just do it and you'll sense it. Okay? Some of you might be here with some things already. Some of you, many of you might be here still. But we have to start with the compare and contrast, which is the inductive reasoning. So at the end of your assessment, you have to come up with three indices of suspicion, compare and contrast them, and that's based on the notes that you take when we talk about the different types of injuries for body areas. Okay? There will come a point when you'll do your history, and just from the history alone, you've gathered all the information, and you know it's that. And that's what I did with Matthew this morning. Okay. So we'll start off with that injury. He received the ball. He on the outside leg and shot up his leg. And then he went back in, taped him. Just some range of motion testing and strength testing, palpated it, and I iced it afterwards. Okay. Previous injury? Previous injury, it was just two days ago we did the same thing. No being tingling? When it happened? Pardon? No being tingling when it happened? No. Cold toes? No. And it just and it went up his lower leg? Yeah, he just felt a, like a jolt kind of thing just like going up his leg. And where's his pain now? Um, it's your, like show us on your foot. Alright. Yeah, you have to hold your leg up in the air. Okay, well, here's just some. Where is this here? So it's just right around here. Okay. This anterior lateral compartment kind of just going up. This okay. Way. Again. So let's say that's all the information you have. Some people might already know what it is. I kind of have a feeling what it might be. Any ideas? 